A lie repeated a thousand times becomes the truth. The man who said that even proved it. The lie became part of himself and the system he served. His name was Josef Goebbels. He was Nazi Germany's minister of propaganda. The myths that he created exist to this day. These are the children of Josef Goebbels. Several years after this picture was taken, the Third Reich's principal ideologist decided to sacrifice their lives. He did so after realizing that all of his media wars had been lost. From the diary of Dr. Joseph Goebbels, June 16, 1941. If we win, who will question our methods? As it is, we have so much to answer for already that we must win. Otherwise, we, those who are the head of all that we hold dear, will be eradicated. So, to work. On June 22, 1941, Nazi Germany invades the Soviet Union without a declaration of war. The bombings and shellings bring about horror and uncertainty of what may lie in store. The German army drops 22 million leaflets on Red Army positions. The great lie begins. В каждой немецкой армии была рота пропаганды. Она занималась выпуском листовок, анализом их влияния, допросом пленных, ну и так далее. Вот. Эти пропаганда компании просуществовали до самого конца войны. Their lies were beautifully phrased. Red Army soldiers were cynically offered to make a choice, either to perish at the hand of the indestructible German army or to surrender and return to their families to live happily ever after. One of their goals was to turn the Red Army soldiers against their commanders and commissars. Это была одной из линий немецкой пропаганды, что ваши комиссары, они не дают вам возможности перейти к немцам и таким образом сохранить свои жизни, так что берите свою судьбу в свои руки, бейте комиссаров или гоните их, в зависимости от того, какая была листовка, и переходите к немцам. From a memo by the head of the high command of the Wehrmacht, Field Marshal General Wilhelm Keitel. Political commissars bear a special distinction, a red star with a sickle and hammer on their sleeve. They must be separated from other POWs in order to deny them the ability to influence captured soldiers. Upon being separated from the prisoners, they are to be eliminated. However, even soldiers who weren't political commissars were faced with life far from the bliss described in Germany's pamphlets. By mid-1942, less than half of the 3.5 million Red Army soldiers who'd surrendered were still alive. A photo exhibition called Through Captivity was recently held in Moscow in their memory. Several German students were keen to attend. Ожидали их вот такие вот лагеря для военнопленных. Голое поле, натянутая кольчу проволока, по бокам вышки с пулеметами и больше ничего. Никаких то отапливаемых или вообще каких-либо бараков, нерегулярного питания. Вот здесь можно видеть, что военнопленные меняют какие-то свои вещи на хлеб. Все это приводит к массовой смертности, поэтому из тех, кто попал в плен на начальном этапе, мы считаем, что выжили не проценты, а скорее даже сотые доли процентов. Memo from the High Command of the Wehrmacht, Confidential, September 8, 1941. This is the first time that German soldiers face an adversary instructed not only in the ways of war, but also politics. Thus, Bolshevik soldiers have forfeited the right to be treated like true soldiers in accordance with the Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war. Less than a month after Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union, News came that Stalin's eldest son, Jacob, was missing in action. Soon, photos of him appeared on German propaganda leaflets. They read that Jacob has voluntarily surrendered to the Nazis. Было много листовок, посвященных пленению Якова Джугашвили. Старались всячески преподнести, что 
вам конец, что, видите, уже и сын Сталина попал в плен, и что он вроде бы сотрудничает с немецкими властями. Яков had indeed been captured. The only difference was that he was captured during an attempt to break out of a siege, rather than voluntarily surrendering. He was brought to Sachsenhausen concentration camp, 35 kilometers from Berlin. He was, a, of course, a prominent prisoner. He was not imprisoned inside the prisoner's camp for ordinary prisoners, where we are standing now. There was a special camp for prominent prisoners, and this is where he was in prison. Jakob Jugashvili was kept in one of these barracks. Intelligence officers were interrogating him every day, but still couldn't make Yakov cooperate. He was in the camp until 1943. There was even a myth that German officials offered Stalin's son in exchange for German Field Marshal Paulus, who had been captured in Stalingrad in 1943, another story that was later disproved. After Jakob Dugashvili realized he was being used by Nazi propaganda, he decided to take his own life by jumping on a barbed wire in a prison camp here in Sachsenhausen. In total, over 100,000 people perished in Sachsenhausen during its years of operation. It was where SS officers underwent training in order to serve at new concentration camps located throughout occupied countries. That included death camps built for the purpose of annihilating entire peoples. The so-called Nazi Eisensgruppen killed more than two million Jews on occupied Soviet soil. They delivered death without mercy, women, children, even the elderly. Most normal people would go mad having to execute orders like that. But officers in SS uniform had no such qualms. Never for a moment did they consider that what they were doing was wrong, let alone it being a crime. They were trained and prepared by Nazi propaganda. Today, even the radical measures are not radical enough. Josef Goebbels used to say. Here in the USSR, German soldiers were captives of another myth, that in order to bring down the Soviet system, it was essential to annihilate the Jews, since they were believed to be the primary foundation of Bolshevism. In other occupied countries, the Germans would force the Jews into ghettos, though they were allowed to live. After invading the USSR, the Nazis began to annihilate entire Jewish communities. Мы видим открытки, которые посылались на фоне практически расстрелов в семье, жене и детям, где солдат пишет очень нежные строки о том, как он по ним скучает и, и как ему без них плохо, и гордо рассказывает о том, как он уничтожал еврейских свиней. Геббельсовская пропаганда активно работала, с одной стороны, на унижение других народов, а с другой стороны, на возвеличивание простого немца. In his younger years, Josef Goebbels made several unsuccessful attempts at becoming a writer and journalist. The career of the Third Reich's main ideologist took off after the Nazis won elections. One of his first initiatives was the practice of book burnings, reminiscent of burning heretics at the stake in medieval times. The first book burning took place in 1933 in the center of Berlin under the motto, let's clear Germany of un-German ideas. Это очень нравилось, это было совершенно новое, потому что немцы себя чувствовали очень униженными. А э, Геббельс интуитивно он ощущал, что нужно сказать вот этим массам, чтобы они шли за ним. Знаете, как э, музыкант из города Хаммеля, который играл на дудочке, и крысы за ним шли. In today's Berlin, books are sold right next to the spot where they were once burned. There are lots of history books here, including those on the Nazis' rise to power in Germany. This is the moment when Goebbels' office got the green light. The so-called Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda of the Third Reich was housed in this building on Wilhelmstrasse. From 1933 to 1941, the agency's budget increased nearly tenfold. Геббельс пробил такую концепцию, чтобы промышленность немецкая выпускала радиоприемники, доступные каждому немцу, так, чтобы каждый немец мог слушать радиопередачи. Кроме этого, про это, может быть, не все знают, но именно усилиями Геббельса и во времена Третьего рейха были произведены первые трансляции телевизионных программ для простых смертных. 
These are ultra-right-wing rallies in modern Germany. They do not directly associate themselves with the ideas of the Third Reich. They are fighting to make jobs available to Germans rather than to immigrants from other countries. Germany has lived through this before, and what these slogans led to is well known. But for ultra-right-wing supporters, the Germany of the 1930s is a model of order and stability. This is another example of a history lesson some people fail to learn, this time in Ukraine. The slogan, glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes, heard in Kiev, is a carbon copy of the greeting used by Ukrainian nationalists who collaborated with Hitler's forces during the war. Причем эти люди иногда делали то, что брезговали делать сами немцы. Иногда, да, с оружием в руках, они убивают даже не сколько партизан, сколько сочувствующие партизанам местное население. In early 2014, during the so-called Euromaidan rally in Kiev, local nationalists reverently carried portraits of Stepan Bandera. In 1941, he tried to establish an independent republic of Ukraine as a protectorate of Hitler's Germany. Вы разумеете, что никакой государственности им даже близко не светило, и если говорить о тех деятелях, которые пытались как-то, заигрывая с немцами, пытаются построить самостоятельную государственность, то они чаще всего либо немцами ликвидировались, либо сажались в концлагеря, где от них, по мнению немцев, было больше пользы, как от символа. By no means should one introduce any measures giving non-Germans a sense of ownership. Members of the non-German population should in no way have access to higher education. The Führer is of the opinion that reading and writing skills are quite enough for them. That includes so-called Ukrainians. Red Army soldiers had to pay a great price to liberate the territories occupied by the Nazis. Victory Day is one of the most, if not the most, cherished national holidays in Russia. Despite the fact that nearly 70 years have passed since the end of the Second World War, numerous outrageous myths continue to spread, some of which even Goebbels would envy. А Сталин, хоть и имел свои особенности, уж я-то это знаю, наша семья была и раскулаченной, и чего только, через чего мы только не прошли, и беды, и испытания, но я бы никогда знак нравится, даже не пытался Сталин. After the war, many German generals were all too keen to publish their memoirs, while Stalin's staff officers were forbidden to do so. That's why much of what's known about the Second World War in Europe was learned largely from memoirs written by the defeated side.
on our reporters' Twitter and Instagram. To be in the know, follow us online. We are not talking the language of war, but I will only react to situations. I have read the reports, but uh, I'm not in a position to... No, I will leave that to the State Department to comment on your latter point. I don't want to say that, yeah. Hey, Mr. Kerry, do you have any comments on the document? Uh, no. no comment? Yeah, we got no Thank you. No more weasel words. When you evade a direct question, be prepared for a chase. When you throw a punch, be ready for a battle. Freedom of speech means little without the freedom to question. I know CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News have taken some knocks lately, but the fact is I admire their commitment to cover all sides of a story, just in case one of them happens to be accurate. <laughs> that was funny, but it's closer to the truth than you might think. <laughs> <laughs> because when politicians and the mainstream media work side by side, the joke is actually on you. <laughs> At RT News, we have a different approach. Because the news of the world just is not this funny. I'm not laughing, damn it, I'm not laughing! <laughs> <laughs> You guys stick to the jokes, we'll handle the news. <laughs> This is Ismailova Park, a popular tourist destination today. But few people know that during the Second World War, one of the country's top secret constructions was hidden away here. So secret that a special metro line was built to connect it to the Kremlin. In 1936, the district of Ismailova became a forbidden zone. Construction began on the central USSR stadium named after Joseph Stalin, which was meant for 200,000 spectators. But three years later, work was put on hold. The facility, disguised as a stadium, was in fact already completed. In October 1941, another myth appeared. There were rumors that the Soviet government had abandoned Moscow, the offices in the Kremlin were empty, and that the city had been surrendered to the Germans. But the truth was that Stalin never actually left Moscow and continued working in the secret bunker here in Ismailova. Stalin always spoke quietly. For this reason, special acoustics were designed so that everyone sitting at this table could hear him. The conference hall of the general headquarters looks more like a palace. Stalin's private chambers remain in immaculate condition. A battle map hangs on the wall. It was updated daily while Stalin worked here. Another common myth is that Stalin and his circle allegedly reinforced the German army with their own hands just before the war started. The Wehrmacht's officers are said to have conducted military exercises at Soviet training ranges. In reality, after Hitler came to power, the volume of military cooperation between Germany and the USSR fell considerably. From the diary of Dr. Joseph Goebbels, June 1941, cooperation with Russia was in fact a stain on our honor. But we shall soon wipe it clean. I said this to the Fuhrer. He agrees with me completely. The Fuhrer believes the operation will take about four months. But I believe even less. We are on the brink of an unprecedented, victorious military campaign. We must act. Researcher Igor Pikhalov is the author of the book The Great War That Was Lied About, based on archive materials. In his book, the author attempts to debunk the most common myth, namely that Stalin was preparing to attack Nazi Germany himself, but Hitler turned out to be smarter and struck first. 
Точно такой же миф изложен, например, в брошюре, изданной ведомством Геббельса в 1943 году для населения наших оккупированных территорий. Называется «Что скрывает советская власть?». То Если мы обратимся к документам и к свидетельствам, значит, то выясняется, что в общем -то, никакого превентивного нападения не было. Причем это прекрасно понимали не только а, сказать, это те же самые Геббельс и прочие так сказать, его подручные, но и в общем -то, немецкие генералы. In 1941, the Soviet defense industry was working at full capacity. Despite this, the number of German military units at the border exceeded the Soviet army's fivefold. This distribution of forces would have made a preemptive attack on Germany unwise. The first days of the Nazi invasion remain shrouded in mystery, and yet there was one myth during the years of perestroika. Stalin had so much faith in Hitler's non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union that he was blind to the German threat and consequently failed in his own responsibility as the country's commander-in-chief. The myth that Stalin was in a state of shock could be easily refuted. A recently declassified document reveals Stalin's schedule for June 22, 1941, the day Nazi Germany invaded the USSR. Stalin's visitors, People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs, Molotov, arrived at 5.45, left at 12.05. Chief of General Staff Zhukov arrived at 5.45, left at 8.30. Deputy People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs, Vyshinsky, arrived at 7.30, left at 10.40. Comintern leader Dimitrov arrived at 8.40, left at 10.40. <laughs> Создавший соврат должен будет скоро убедить Совета. Вместе с Красной Армией поднимаются многие тысячи оружных, полузвозников, интеллигенций, на войну с напавшим врагом, поднимутся миллионные массы нашего народа. Народ победил не благодаря так называемому мудрому руководству Сталина. Нет, у Сталина было множество ошибок. Расчетов. В начале войны не об этом сейчас речь, а речь о том, что именно наш народ, его сплоченность, его единство, его мужество помогли нам выдержать эту страшную угрозу. Here from the Brandenburg gates in the heart of Berlin, Nazi troops marched before heading to the Eastern Front. Prior to invading the Soviet Union, Germany had prepared the so-called Plan Ost or Plan East. It would have involved about 80% of the population of conquered countries to be moved out by force and replaced with people of the master race. The plan was to be carried out immediately after Germany's victory over the Soviet Union. The plan to colonize parts of the Soviet Union extended over the next 30 years. As long as German troops continued to fight, it remained top secret in order to avoid an uprising. The population of the occupied territories was still being fed myths about their future happy, prosperous life. According to the plan, two cities were to be completely destroyed, Leningrad and Moscow. The siege of Leningrad lasted 900 days, during which nearly 600,000 people died of starvation. In recent years, another myth has appeared that such human losses could have been avoided if the Soviet command had surrendered the city to the Nazis. But anyone who says that has no idea of Hitler's master plan and the fate he had in store for the city and its residents. From the diary of the Chief of the General Staff, Franz Halter, July 8, 1941. The Führer is determined to raise Moscow and Leningrad to the ground to make sure that we don't have to feed their population in winter. These cities must be demolished by airstrikes. This national catastrophe will not only wipe off the centers of Bolshevism, but also that of the entire Moscovy.
One year after the siege of Leningrad began, a break in the course of war finally arrived. Field Marshal Pauls, the author of Operation Barbarossa, was defeated at Stalingrad. It then became clear to many Wehrmacht soldiers and officers that the quick and victorious war that Goebbels promised on the Eastern Front had also turned out to be a myth. After the defeat in the Battle of Stalingrad, many high-ranking Nazi officers were taken prisoner. They were brought here to a POW camp outside Moscow. After that great defeat, many captured Nazis began to cooperate with Soviet authorities and apply their own propaganda technique to anti-fascist campaigning. From that moment on, Goebbels' propaganda had to compete with pamphlets encouraging German advance forces to surrender to Soviet troops. То, что наша пропаганда сделала, это она заронила сомнения в немецкие души, что война для них кончится благополучно. Наша пропаганда способствовала тому, что 2 миллиона 200 тысяч немцев предпочли поднять руки Хенде Хох, чем погибнуть. 1945, the war is coming to an end. Josef Goebbels' office calls for the last resources to be thrown at the war effort. The Hitler Youth weren't enough to defend Berlin, so military propaganda encouraged women and the elderly to take up arms. When Soviet troops entered Berlin, Goebbels and his family fled to Hitler's bunker that was hidden underneath the square. It's now filled with soil, and a Holocaust memorial has been erected on top of it. On May 1st, 1945, the Third Reich's chief ideologist and his wife Magda committed suicide. Before doing so, they poisoned all six of their children with cyanide. Убийство было аранжировано, сделано тоже как особенно такой акт. И ходили в белые одеяния, очень красиво причесали. Дети заснули. Магда сама лично вложила ампулы с цианистым калием в рот каждого из своих детей и проследила, чтобы эту ампулу действительно зубами ребенка была разломана, чтобы яд действительно затек в рот. Not long before his death, Dr. Goebbels wrote his last invective. He spoke about the threat of the Iron Curtain, that the communists would drop over Europe. Ironically, these words were written at Goebbels' mansion. It was located on the spot where construction would soon start on the embassy of the United States, the USSR's principal Cold War rival. Goebbels' plan to sow discord within the ranks of the anti-Hitler coalition worked out as this is exactly what happened. During a speech in Fulton in 1946, Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, repeated almost word for word what Goebbels had said about the danger to Europe from behind the Iron Curtain. The myths created by the chief Nazi ideologist found fertile soil in the West and grew to provide fuel for the struggle against communism. We have to fight these myths today in memory of those who won in the Second World War.